I'm Mitch Pileggi. There are a lot of amazing stories out there, full of mystery and wonder. But things are not always what they seem when you explore the unknown. Tonight, this woman says she can speak to the dead. Did your papa go fast, please? Yeah. Because he said to me, boom, right out of here. But is it all a scam? Don't mess with me now. I've proven that there is life after death. I walked on fire. This man gets people to walk over hot coals. I'm a little bit nervous. But is it as dangerous as it looks? You will not forget this night as long as you're alive. Unbelievable surgery without instruments or anesthesia. The doctor can open the patient up just with their hands. But is it real or an illusion? Above us was a craft with a beam coming down. Was this man really abducted by aliens? We know that all experience is derived from the brain. This scientist can simulate abductions in his lab. Is this object, captured on tape by NASA cameras aboard the space shuttle, hard evidence of an alien visitation? There's some kind of a spacecraft out there. Or is there a more down-to-earth explanation? Sixth Sense, ESP, Clairvoyance. There are many mystical names given to the centuries-old practice of mind reading. But do people who claim to be psychic really possess a mysterious power? Or is it all just an act? Did your papa go fast, please? Yeah. Because he said to me, boom, right out of here. Do it you want a massive heart attack. Because he said, boom, I'm Suzanne right out of here. Suzanne Northrup says she can talk to the dead. Tied in with it. His yeah. mama's also gone. Am I correct on that, Carrie Ann? Yes, she is. Yes, because he said, my mama's with me. And I don't know who he's making reference to. I don't know if somebody liked Rose's. Was named Rose or Rose My Rose. grandmother was Rose. Was Northrup is a psychic please? medium. Yeah. Okay, Gifted, she says, cool. with a rare ability. I hear somebody had a stroke connected to her also, and I don't know if that might have been her. It was her. It was her, because she shows me one side of her body that usually means stroke to me. Do you understand? I'm sort of like a telephone between this world and the other world. Somehow I'm able to tune into the frequencies of people that have passed over or people that have physically died. But are psychics, like Suzanne Northrup, for real? Is the psychic an outright charlatan, or is it somebody who's self-deluded? They really believe that what they're doing is real. You can't explain it by fraud and you can't explain it by social psychological cueing, and you can't explain it by statistical coincidence. So how else are you going to explain it? Whether you believe her or not, him, Suzanne Northrup's yes. readings are undeniably and dramatic and amazingly accurate. Name, but I want to say I hear David Danny really, really strong. Danny. Who is that, please? My husband. OK, thank you. For me, it's been my life experience. This isn't just something that I did a few years. It has been something that's been with me my whole life. Your brother seemed to feel go very fast, don't ask me why. Yeah. That's what he tells me. And I don't know what was wrong with him, but I'm feeling throughout my blood. He tells me my... Yeah, the kidneys. Yeah, because he, he said... Had a transplant. Well, he said... Can blood. Suzanne Northrup really communicate with the dead? There is something going on that we need to take very seriously. Gary Schwartz, a University of Arizona psychology professor, recently studied a number of renowned psychics, including Suzanne Northrup, under scientifically controlled conditions. She is more than 50% accurate when someone like myself would be about 5% accurate. It absolutely befuddles us how she could know this information short of receiving it through some sort of psychic means. And his mama was also there, so there must have been a grandmother connected yes. to him okay. with the name Mary or Marie, very clearly. I believe that was her name. Yeah. Don't mess with me now. Don't tell me that this is not real. Don't tell me that I'm a wacko. Don't tell me that I make this up because now I've been tested. But does a high degree of accuracy in a psychic reading verify psychic ability? Skeptics say no. It only proves that the psychic has mastered the tricks of the trade. I think you have to look at the evidence and the scientific claims very carefully. It's not Mark it's a, Edward a, made his living as a medium for 10 years, but he confesses okay. to having no psychic so, ability uh, and he's willing important. to expose I, I others who don't. Technique is to go very fast, say a lot of things, so fast that the normal average person doesn't have a chance to respond or reconstruct what you just said. In order to demonstrate the methods phony psychics will utilize, we had Mark Edward offer free psychic readings at a shopping mall. Everyone who sat down with Mark believed they were with a real psychic. I'm Mark. I'm sorry, I'm Joe. Hi, Joe. Have a seat. I think when people go to a psychic, they expect to see 
some accurate information. So over the years, I've made my own little collection of uh, uh, phrases that seem to fit. One of them is, why do I pick up Charles? Who's Charles? An older guy that lives across from me. I'm getting the name like Charles. I had an Uncle Charlie. Um, Uncle Charlie? Yeah. Who's Charles? My husband. If it hits, fine. If it doesn't. Where do I hear the name Joseph? Very strong Joseph. You just tell the person, watch for it. No. Just think about it, okay? Joseph George, sometimes I'll hear a like, but you'll, you'll check. Okay. Okay. Another technique is just using initials. The letter M is in so many different names, male and female names. It, you really can't go wrong with the letter M. Who's he giving me with the M name female? M name female. M Would this be the niece? You know the name I'm hearing is Michelle. I don't know why, but Michelle that's... Michelle is his daughter's middle name. Thank you very much. But even Northrop isn't right all of the time. Now, Grandpa went many years before her, please? No. It's the other way around? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot of methods that... that uh, psychics or fraudulent readers use to convince a client they, that they didn't say something that was wrong when in fact they did. So they have a way to make a right turn or a left turn. Why would he talk about a car, Joanne? Did he pass a car down? Was a car a big deal or something? No, but he was a, a car. My husband's restoring a car. Ah, oh, that's what it is. Thank you. So you're fishing, but you're getting a response that seems like, oh, he is on the right track. For example, one of the things that I say is uh, wh why do I feel this distance? Why do I feel this distance with her? It can mean two things. It can mean geographic distance or it can mean emotional distance. Um, maybe it's because she lives in Alabama. Now, if she had said no, she lives right down the street, and I'd say, well, there's an emotional distance that's kind of been there between the two of you. You're giving yourself out so that you constantly have another path to go. And I also think your father wore hats because he shows me hats on his head. Uh, no, he didn't. <laughs> then was he losing his hair? Um, a little bit, Okay, yes. because that's what it I mean, It's got to be one or the other when he shows that to me. And you just keep going, and you don't stop until the show's over. And when the show is over, they'll remember the hits, and they'll forget the misses. But perhaps the most common technique okay, now, that Edward believes a psychic con will use is simply letting their subject talk, unwittingly volunteering information that the psychic then incorporates into the reading. Something that he would have in his room, like either on a wall or a desk or something. Yep. It had to be very significant. It was a pocket knife. I couldn't tell what it was, I, you know, because I can't always and distinguish. And my carries it with him all the time because, he because says, it was from him. That's what, because he says it's very, I couldn't tell what it was. It looked small, yeah. and it wasn't a ring, it wasn't a watch, because usually those I'll get real sp specific. So I couldn't tell, but it kind of looked like this. It's... Is Suzanne Northrup a master of the psychic con? not to those she reads. Everything she said was right on the money. I mean, everything. He also shows in the month of July. Very, very strong. Don't know why he showed me that month. Usually, I mean, it's a birth or passing. Uh, my birthday is in July. Thank you. I guess wow. he's giving you an acknowledgment. She does have a gift. It's phenomenal. My philosophy about psychic phenomenon is that it does occur from time to time with all of us. But I think that when somebody says that they're going to make it happen and that they can do it on a consistent basis, I don't buy it. I sympathize with the skeptic. There are many people in the field who in all likelihood are fraudulent. On the other hand, these individuals seem to receive information which they could not know from ordinary means. To Mark Edward, this special about, knowledge is just knowing how to pull off a convincing con. It's entertainment. I'm not a real psychic. Oh my God. Wow, that's, 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 that's really weird. Well, Jennifer. how did you come up with the names and things? I always say Charles. Oh. And as long as it is entertainment and it is put in those terms, I see nothing wrong with it. I'm not really a psychic. You're not really? No. Are you kidding? No. Cool. Coming up, a strange object in outer space. But is it a UFO? Whatever these objects are, are very, very close to the shuttle. And next, is it safe to walk on hot coals? As soon as you believe that you can do this, you have the confidence to take that first step. This Taiwanese family claims to possess magnetic bodies. Lin Yu Zhang says he discovered his personal magnetism at a party when he stuck a spoon on his forehead. A physicist can't explain how the Lin's do it. We find nothing, which means there is no magnetic field involved. 
because it can also attract glasses. Researchers wondered if the lens sweat was particularly sticky, but tests revealed nothing unusual. Some have suggested that their bodies have unusually flat surfaces that offer maximum contact with objects. The Lins are hoping for a career in show business. Common sense says fire will burn us. Yet every year, thousands ignore their instincts and walk across red-hot coals. How can fire walking be safe? Michael Shermer travels to Northern California to investigate the belief that it's all in the mind. To do it is to defy all common sense and logic. Walking across 1,200 degree red-hot embers barefoot. Yet, firewalking has become a popular motivational exercise around the world. But how is firewalking possible? Does it really require a positive mental state? Or is it simply a lot less dangerous than it looks? As soon as you believe that you can do this without burning your feet, you have the confidence to take that first step. The people who promote firewalking claim that your mind somehow protects your foot, but it's normal physics that's operating in a firewalk. From tribal rituals to New Age seminars, firewalking has been a human rite of passage for over 3,000 years. And today, firewalking is still practiced by a variety of cultures all over the world. This is actually a very ancient tradition. Uh, the Buddhist religion had firewalking in it. The Hindu religion had firewalking in it. The Native Americans firewalk. The fire is really a metaphor. Tali Burkan is, is the founder of FIRE, fire. the, the Firewalking fire Institute of Research and Education, cool which conducts self-improvement seminars, utilizing firewalking as an inspirational tool. The next time you're in a situation that used to intimidate you, you will remember, I walked on fire. And if I can do that, Certainly, I can go in there and ask for a raise. To prepare a fire walk, Burkan burns large oak logs down to sizzling red embers, creating a bed of coals. The resulting heat reaches a temperature of over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I joined Burkan's group for a night of fire walking and wondered, how could this not burn my bare skin? Burkan believes positive thinking actually changes the body's physiology allowing a firewalker to cross these coals safely. When you are in the right state of mind, the blood flows through the soles of your feet and takes the temperature away from the tissue. And that's why you're not burned. None of it has to do with the, their psychological state. All of it has to do with ordinary physics. Dr. Bernard Lichen is a physicist and firewalking skeptic. You don't burn your feet in a firewalk because you're walking on things that have poor thermal conductivity and a low heat capacity. Even though they're at a high temperature, they don't have as much energy as you might think, and they aren't very good at putting it into your foot. To understand the physics, imagine baking a cake. The cake's been in the oven for half an hour. Everything in the oven is at 325 degrees, but you don't worry about the 325 degree air burning you or the 325 degree cake, only the 325 degree cake pan. Earlier that day, as the wood was burned in preparation, Burkan's anxious group was preparing to take their fiery stroll. Among them, Katherine Johnson. I think that the mental preparation before the fire walking is going to be very important because I don't feel like confident enough to do it right now. I'm a little bit nervous about it. Would Burkan's inspirational speech give Katherine the confidence to fire walk and protect her from injury? Fire is a symbol for all the things you thought you couldn't do, for all of the things that have ever intimidated you. If you can walk across this fire tonight, I promise you, you will not forget this night as long as you're alive. And what about me? I made it a point of avoiding Burkan's speech so as not to be influenced. Finally, the temperature of the coal soars past 1,000 degrees. The firewalk is ready, and Catherine has decided to do it. Burkan leads the way, taking the first step down the fiery path. The others follow, including Catherine. 
it was pretty hot and hurt my feet a little bit, but nothing serious. And I had a really great time doing this. It makes me feel great. Now it's my turn. Remember, I was in my car during Tolly's speech and was not part of the supposedly critical mental preparation. Well, my feet feel great. There's no pain. There's no burning on them at all, just a little charcoal. I could do it again. I could do it three or four times. No problem. It's just physics. It's conductivity of heat. It's not psychic power. It's not chanting. But Burkan is quick to point out that my confidence in the scientific theory behind fire walking could have been what protected my feet from the red hot embers. Whether you're a physicist and you believe in the laws of physics, or whether you're someone who just believes in me because you trust me, as soon as you walk into the fire with a belief that you're not going to burn your feet, you are in a different physiological state than the person who thinks they're going to get burned. I think it's still just heat conductivity. The reason people don't get burned is because it's just not that hot. I didn't get burnt, and I didn't chant, I didn't meditate, and I wasn't thinking positive thoughts. In fact, I was nervous. It's not the people who don't get burned that are a curiosity. I still am waiting for an explanation. Well, why, why are people really badly burned? I've seen people horrifically burned. While I don't buy into Tolly's psychological theory, Katherine Johnson does. I'm very glad I had the opportunity to do this. I think the mental preparation was very important to the safety of this. And Katherine believes her firewalk will have lasting effects. This was a wonderful experience. Sometime I'll be afraid of questioning a teacher or something and say, oh, I walked on fire. I can do this. I'm not trying to use the firewalk as an example of contradicting any physical laws. I'm trying to give you a sense of what's possible so you can experience the exhilaration of breaking through your limiting beliefs, which will give you the courage to attempt things you might not have attempted before. Whether you accept Tolly Burkan's explanation or the scientific theory, one thing is certain, under the proper controlled conditions, anyone can walk on fire and live to tell about it. Coming up. Above us was a craft with a beam coming down. Are people really being abducted by aliens? The scientist can simulate abductions in his lab. And next, the doctor can open the patient up just with their hands. Is psychic surgery just an illusion? Are fairies real? Well, photos don't lie. Or do they? In 1917, two little girls in England dazzled the world with these astonishing snapshots. Beautiful little winged creatures flying through a garden. 16-year-old Elsie Wright and her cousin, 10-year-old Frances Griffiths, claimed they'd taken them at their Yorkshire cottage. Though many doubted the story, noting that the fairies looked an awful lot like cutouts from a popular children's book, the girls swore it was true. Even the author of the Sherlock Holmes story, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, defended the girls, firmly proclaiming the photos were undeniable proof that fairies were real. Skeptics continued to doubt the girls, but they stuck by their story. Decades later, however, when Elsie was in her 80s, she finally admitted the truth. The photos were fake. Her comment? How on earth anyone could be so gullible as to believe they were real was always a mystery to me. It seems every day we learn of yet another amazing breakthrough in medical science, a new drug or technology that saves lives. But in spite of these recent advances, a controversial supernatural treatment is still popular around the world. Does it actually work? Or are the sick being fooled at a time when they desperately need help? It's called psychic surgery, an ancient healing technique that is still practiced today in the Philippines, South America, and in backroom clinics in the United States. Psychic surgery is a technique that's been used for thousands of years by medicine men and shamans and witch doctors where the doctor can open the patient up, sometimes just with their hands, 
and apparently go into the body and extract the diseased part of the human and throw it away and then seal it up with little or no blood, miraculously healing the patient. Thousands seek this controversial treatment. For some, it is their last hope. First and foremost, people go to psychic surgeons because they have no other recourse. It's out of desperation. They have no other alternatives. And even the psychic surgeons themselves often say this, that this person came to me because no one else could cure them. They didn't know what else to do. They had no other choice. Well, I've had uh, nine operations now. I had a heart operation. I had a gallbladder removal. I had my appendix removed. I had quite a large growth taken out. I didn't know I had. My wife is cured of cancer, and I can use my leg now. So I pray every morning and night that the medium has strength to continue working. These procedures are done under the crudest of conditions. The patient does not receive any anesthesia, and anecdotal evidence suggests they do not feel any pain. The key to the psychic surgery phenomena is the claim that the practitioner is taken over by a spirit. The medium is generally thought to be possessed by a spirit, quite often the spirit of a doctor, of a Western trained doctor, who comes into the medium's body, takes control of the body, and then proceeds with the surgery. Medical experts say that what we are seeing is a trick, an effective illusion, a scam. Is psychic surgery a deliberate attempt to deceive desperate and sick people? What you've just seen is a fraud. The patient, the assistant, the doctor are all professional magicians. The doctor starts by cleansing the patient and then apparently makes an incision into the patient using a technique of concealment. What looks to be random actions are actually very carefully choreographed actions of concealment and misdirection, creating the illusion that the hand is going deep, deep inside the body. It's a pretty effective illusion. Now a piece of intestine or an apparent tumor is taken out. It has to be coming from somewhere. But magicians use sleight of hand techniques combined with optical illusion to create a very convincing effect. But if it's all sleight of hand, where's the hand going? It may appear as if it's going deep inside the body. But this illusion is accomplished by simply bending the fingers and hiding it from the audience. When this technique is combined with the appearance of blood and tissue, the effect can be quite convincing. What you saw had certain graphic uh, parts in it in which you th believed that you saw the finger and the actual hand entering the body. Of course, that was not so at all. James Randi, renowned investigator of the paranormal, lectures worldwide on the fraudulent practices of psychic surgeons. Here, he shows how blood and tissue are introduced with a simple magician's prop. There's no way that you can see it or detect it because it looks like very much a part of me. And all it is is simply a plastic thimble shaped like a thumb. It had blood and a piece of chicken material in it. And as you come down to the body, the other hand is placed on top of it like this. This thumb is withdrawn and the blood immediately starts to flow. And the piece of chicken or whatever you've got in there is taken out. We can explain the techniques, the sleight of hand, the illusion. But how can we explain the positive effect that some of these procedures have on their patients? Most people think magic is about manipulating objects. Magic is perhaps more about manipulating perception. When the shaman goes in and pulls out the tumor, the people understand that the sickness is leaving the body and perhaps this can trigger a placebo effect because as doctors even know that your state of mind affects your physical health. What's important is that the patient believes that what they've been told is going to happen happens. Mind over matter, placebo effect, whatever you want to call it, it's the belief in the efficacy of the cure that causes the cure. But is there a danger in allowing people to believe they are being cured by these psychic surgeons? If a person goes to a psychic surgeon with a real physical problem that warrants a physical treatment, then his welfare is liable to be greatly jeopardized. Psychic surgery, a fraudulent technique that nevertheless raises questions about the power of belief, which will always remain a mystery. Coming up, 
Does this official NASA footage prove that flying saucers are real? There's some kind of a spacecraft out there. And next, does this experiment create an alien abduction? Is this photo of Mars, taken more than 20 years ago, proof of an alien civilization? These images, taken in 1998 by the Mars Global Surveyor, reveal the face on Mars to be a rocky mesa worn down by ancient erosion. Some critics still insist NASA is withholding photos that would prove the face on Mars is alien-made. But scientists offer this recent photo of Mars as proof that a happy accident of geology can suggest an artificially created structure. Perhaps there's no greater mystery than the human mind. Many believe we've only just begun to understand its true power, to interpret our experiences, and perhaps even create them. Michael Shermer visits a lab where scientists believe they can control what the mind perceives with the flip of a switch. Out-of-body experiences, alien and angel encounters, fantastic stories reported each year by millions of ordinary, credible people. Above us was a craft with a beam coming down. I could literally feel this warm beam shining down on us. I saw this tunnel, like a dark tunnel with a light at the end of it. There was also a guardian angel that was there. It, to me, it seemed that it was like angel wings or something were right there and the presence was I was in a was car, set. a friend of mine was driving, she hit a fire hydrant, and I went through the windshield of the car, but I experienced it from the back seat. I watched myself go leave the front seat and go through the windshield. Fantastic reports made even more baffling to experts because the people who come forward have absolutely nothing to gain and much to lose in revealing their intimate and often embarrassing encounters. When people do report these experiences, often they're sincere and honest and they typically don't show uh, the usual evidence for, let's say, schizophrenia. Certainly all of them are not liars. In fact, it only may be a small fraction the experiences these people have had are clearly very real. The question is, do they represent something out in the world or inside the brain? Here at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada, people are having these strange experiences every day. The difference, scientists are triggering them with, of all things, magnets. Here, in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Persinger, science fiction is rapidly becoming science fact. A motorcycle helmet wired to produce magnetic fields which influences the electrical activity of the wearer's brain produces ghosts, angels, and aliens. Since 1971, Dr. Persinger has devoted his research to proving that paranormal encounters are illusions created by the brain itself. Tiny changes in chemistry, minute alterations in electrical activity can create powerful hallucinations that seem absolutely real. These misfirings of the human brain can occur naturally, especially in the brains of intelligent, creative, sensitive people. Data collected from these kinds of subjects has formed the groundwork for a computer simulation of a paranormal encounter. We know that all experience is derived from the brain. We also realize that subtle patterns generate complex human experiences and emotions. So effectively what we did, thanks to computer technology, is we extracted the patterns, electromagnetic patterns generated from the brain during these experiences. And then we re-expose volunteers to these patterns. Okay, helmet time, Michael. Easy rider. Dr. Persinger's next volunteer, me. While being wired and blindfolded, I have plenty of time to reflect on what I am about to experience. A very sensitive part of my brain called the temporal lobes, located on either side just above my ears, is about to be bombarded with a series of electromagnetic pulses. The pulses will assault both my memory and my ability to unscramble information collected from my five senses. My brain is about to attempt to make sense of some very distorted signals. See you in a bit. Okay. I sit in the dark in perfect silence for nearly an hour. And yes, even a skeptic's mind can start to play tricks on him. I feel a presence rush by me. In fact, I'm not sure that it wasn't me running past myself. I know it sounds crazy, but I really did sense that someone was in the room with me, courtesy of the magnetic influences being created on my temporal lobes. 
What's happening to Michael now is he's being exposed to uh, complex magnetic fields. The pulse being generated is that which is associated with opiate-like experiences such as floating and pleasantness and spinning sometimes. Halfway through my hour of isolation, the computer begins generating a markedly darker experience for my brain. At this point, there is now another pattern being generated. It's primarily being generated along the right hemisphere, which means it tends to be more associated with more terrifying experiences. That's right, folks. He said, terrifying. Under these conditions, volunteers have reported meeting the devil, being grabbed by aliens, even being transported to hell. At the end of the hour, I could honestly report that temporal lobe stimulation had been responsible for not only a sensed presence, but an out-of-body experience as well. Yeah, in the first one, uh, it, it felt like um, that, that's when that thing that sort of went by me. I wasn't sure if it was me leaving or somebody or something came by me or something. It was very strange. And then in the second round, um, I did have, it, there was the feeling like um, I, I was in, sort of in, in waves and then like I wanted to come out of my body, but I kept going back in. Yeah, I can really see how if somebody was maybe slightly more fantasy prone and tends to interpret environmental stimuli in a sort of paranormal way, this kind of experience would, would be a real wild trip. Certainly, uh, Dr. Persinger's research on electromagnetic stimulation of the brain that seems to produce some of these phenomena are really groundbreaking and very important in, in confirming what is believed amongst the vast majority of neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists that these beliefs, these percepts, uh, reside in the activity of the brain rather than in the external world. Temporal lobe stimulation may not be responsible for every encounter with the paranormal, but Dr. Persinger's research may be the first step towards demystifying a large number of age-old puzzles. 400 years ago, the paranormal included what in large part is now science today. So that's the fate of the paranormal. It becomes science. It becomes normal. Coming up, if they weren't meteors, they weren't space junk, and they weren't satellites because those things don't change position. A close encounter captured on NASA videotape. Whatever these objects are, are very, very close to the shuttle. But is this really proof of aliens among us? It went from zero to 2,500 miles per hour in one second. Does this child have the power to heal. 15-year-old Audrey Santo has been in a coma since 1987, sustained by the round-the-clock care of her family. In recent years, the Santo home has become a destination for the desperately ill, who pray to Audrey to intercede on their behalf. Some of the sufferers who have visited the makeshift shrine at the Santo's home in a Boston suburb claim to have been cured by the experience. Skeptics say it's not Audrey or God who has healed them. If anything, it is the power of the mind that has activated the body's own ability to heal itself. The Catholic Church is investigating the Audrey phenomenon, including reports of religious statues in the Santo home that weep an oily substance. So far, they have found no evidence of fraud in the house, but the Washington Post spirited a sample out of the Santo's home and delivered it to a Pittsburgh lab. Their analysis revealed that the substance was 80% corn or soybean oil and 20% chicken fat. However, the faithful will continue to visit the home of Audrey Santo in hopes of another miracle. It's easy to dismiss a fuzzy home video of a flying saucer. But what if the footage came from NASA, shot in space from cameras mounted on the space shuttle itself? For nine years, UFO believers have insisted that a few seconds of highly controversial video is proof of alien beings. But what about NASA? What's their explanation? September 12, 1991. The Space Shuttle Discovery blasted off into space, a routine mission underway. Once in orbit, the crew trained cameras mounted inside the shuttle's payload bay on the Earth below. They were recording clouds and storm systems for later analysis. 
In NASA's books, STS-48 was an ordinary flight. Then, the unexpected. Someone monitoring the satellite feed spotted something that galvanized UFO fanatics. Video they claim is evidence of aliens among us. The cameras caught a bright light in the darkness of space, a bright light just below the Earth's horizon. Suddenly, it reversed direction and sped away, demonstrating a speed and versatility, some argue, could only indicate an alien spaceship. To me, the objects are probably ice crystals because the shuttle is a very dirty vehicle. It throws out an awful lot of material, ice crystals from water dumps, from the uh, fuel cells and things of the sort. They are not ice port particles, and I can eliminate everything else, so the only one that's left for me is that there's some kind of a spacecraft out there. Not just any spacecraft, an alien spacecraft. It's an outrageous claim, but Dr. Kasher, a physicist and astronomer at the University of Nebraska, who once worked on the controversial Star Wars defense program, insists it's true. There really aren't too many options. They weren't meteors, they weren't space junk, and they weren't satellites because those things don't change position. Take a close, careful look. A small glowing object suddenly appears in the middle of the screen and moves to the left. Moments later, the mysterious glowing object abruptly changes directions and shoots away. The object stops for half a second, and an ice particle should not do that. It should be a continuous change in velocity, slowing down and stop for an instant and then go. It can't really sit there for half a second and then accelerate away. An interesting theory, but Skeet Vaughn doesn't buy it. Vaughn is a research scientist who spent 40 years with NASA. During that time, he analyzed hundreds of hours of video shot during space shuttle flights. He knows exactly what made the object move and it wasn't little green men. This is what I believe is a small particle very close to the camera. As it goes along here, you'll see a bright flash of light on the left-hand side of the picture here. When you see that flash, that's a thruster firing, and therefore the object is being accelerated by the exhaust plume of the thruster firing. Thrusters. In addition to the main engines, a number of smaller thrusters are located at the rear of the craft. They're used to adjust the shuttle's position in space. When they fire, nearby ice crystals or debris would be blown away. Is that what's happening here? NASA payload specialist astronaut Ron Paris has flown two shuttle missions. He's had a chance to see this kind of space phenomena firsthand. When the sun rises over the horizon for the space shuttle, at that moment, the, these uh, bright objects light up. So that means that they have to be nearby. If they were far away, they would not light up. So uh, that's a pretty strong indicator that whatever these objects are, are very, very close uh, to the shuttle. But the object isn't anywhere near the shuttle, says Dr. Kasher. He claims it's miles away and traveling at remarkable speed. If the main object is as close as 10 miles, then it accelerated at uh, more than 100 G's for a full second. It went from zero to 2,500 miles per hour in one second. That's 100 G's, and that would absolutely flatten a human pilot. Dr. Paris says Kasher simply has the wrong point of view. The problem is you're looking at a 2D image of a 3D thing, and so it looks like it's making an acute angle. It could just be making a small angle, but we're viewing it end on and it's a small angle, but looks like a bigger angle than it really is. NASA points out that the space shuttle's extremely low light camera could also distort the object's size. The small, tiny object will appear to be a fairly large size object because of the blooming effect of the cameras. This video, taken on another routine shuttle flight, clearly shows the blooming phenomenon. As ice particles move into the light, they appear to swell, blooming. Dr. Kasher also presents an astonishing claim for one more odd aspect of the video. Take another hard look. The two flashes of light, the object changes direction. Then just as the mysterious object shoots away, another light streaks through space. One thing that you'll think about if, if there's spacecraft and a streak goes through there, one thing that comes to mind is that this might be some kind of a weapon system shooting at them. 
For Dr. Paris, that's a real stretch. Let's go back again, and instead of looking at the one uh, that everybody's so excited about, let's look somewhere else in the frame. In fact, let's look down here, sort of in the bottom center of the frame. We'll kind of concentrate on that area right after the flash. There it is. And here comes another one of those streaks. So how many of these directed energy beam weapons do we have firing off into space? First of all, you really need to go for the simplest explanations. Lewis Friedman heads the Planetary Society, a group dedicated to space exploration with more than 100,000 members in 140 countries. Which explanation would you gravitate toward? You'd like to gravitate toward the things we understand. And if it's something that you're going to invoke that's extraordinary, like aliens coming down all of a sudden at the lucky moment that you happen to be there to see them that nobody else sees, then you better have some extraordinary evidence and not just the anecdote of a two-dimensional picture for a few seconds. All of the evidence that we have add together to make a very strong case for them to be local objects that are being influenced by things near the shuttle and not large objects that are far away. Perhaps one day, the space shuttle cameras will pick up new images, proof of alien beings so definitive it is not open to interpretation. Data so incontrovertible, no other rational explanation is possible. It would seem today is not that day. Coming up next time on Exploring the Unknown, is it possible to cheat death? This company promises to put you on ice after you die but there's no guarantee that they'll be able to bring you back from the dead. If you try to thaw them out using today's technology, it won't work. It's just a bag of mush. But will the science of the future mean that these corpses will have the last laugh? I think they're going to look back and say, look at all those people that needlessly went to their graves when they didn't have to. Why were they so dumb? Then, the legendary Shroud of Turin, is this really the face of Jesus? The image on the shroud is definitely not a painting. Scientists now claim they've been able to use the stains on the shroud to extract the DNA of God. We proved that it was blood, that it was human, that it was male. That is so asinine. I can't think of a thing to say. Find out just how easy it is to beat a lie detector test. Our national security is hanging in the balance over this antiquated last vestige of witchcraft. That's next time on Exploring the Unknown. Every amazing mystery deserves an investigation, for the truth is often hidden in the shadows of outrageous claims. And the only way to search for these answers, to uncover the real story, is to explore the unknown. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. <laughs>